Welcome to the Rideshare Guy podcast, where you will learn about the rideshare and mobility industry straight from Harry Campbell, who's got over five years experience covering the industry and has talked to thousands of drivers. There's no better place to stay up to date, entertained, and educated. So let's dive in. Ed Walker is a national practice leader of micromobility and shared economy for USI Insurance Services and is considered a top knowledge expert for property and casualty consulting and insurance placement services within his field. He's got 12 years of insurance experience and an underwriting resume of custom insurance product creation for unique exposures. He actually founded his practice group at USI in early 2018 with one goal to ease the burden of insurance for new and evolving mobility risks. So in just a couple short years, Ed has constructed uh, some cost-efficient programs for dozens of regional mobility operators and eventually earn the opportunity to place insurance for some of the largest shared service operators in the world. So Ed, it sounds like you're the guy to talk to about insurance. So how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Harry. How are you? I'm doing well, no complaints. And, uh, you know, I will say that I probably know more about insurance than I ever would have hoped, imagined, or dreamed just because, uh, you know, insurance is such an integral part of mobility and transportation. And, you know, I would even say maybe even that extends to the entire gig economy. Is that sort of what you feel? Absolutely. And, you know, not unlike a lot of, you know, the operators in the space, it's, it, it can commonly be a very overlooked or sometimes, um, you know, underappreciated side of focus for a lot of the startup or middle market operators in the space, um, you know, due to its complex nature and, you know, a very specific tailored approach that can sometimes be required for, you know, depending on how your operations are, are really unfolding. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm excited to dig into all of that with you. I, I promise the questions probably will get a little harder. I realize I just ask you, uh, you know, what you feel about insurance and you're an insurance person. So I'm assuming that you <laughs> enjoy it and I'm assuming that it's something you're passionate about. So uh, don't worry. I, I think they call that a warm up question, right? Of course. Rocking. So cool. Well, I wanted to maybe even rewind the clock a little bit. And I think it would be helpful for you to sort of explain. I mean, I think what I've seen, and you know, maybe this doesn't isn't just insurance, it has to do with regulation. And, you know, anytime there's this new kind of big innovative, and especially when it comes to Uber and Lyft kind of fast moving wave of innovation, I think it causes a lot of opportunities, a lot of disruptions. And I think insurance is typically known as one of the more rigid sort of established industry. So I'm curious to know, maybe rewind and talk a little bit about what you were doing and kind of what you saw when Uber and Lyft. Is that kind of when you started noticing this change to the insurance landscape when it was Uber and Lyft or was it a little later? I know you said you founded uh, this practice in 2018, which was definitely later, but I'm curious to know what you kind of saw from the insurance side and like what were people talking about and saying at, you know, all of the cool insurance conferences you probably used to go to uh, before the pandemic. Yeah, of course. So um, back when Uber and Lyft first launched, uh, I was in Chicago um, working for a different brokerage at the time, focused on the technology space. And I'll say that, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head is, is, is insurance being very rigid. I, I, I would categorize, categorize insurance as very uh, as moving at a very glacial pace. Got when it. Uber and Lyft first, when Uber and Lyft first came out, the, the insurance landscape was much different than it is now because we were actually dealing with a very soft market and what a soft market is typically in insurance is, you know, claims just really aren't a bad across the board. So what you have is, is a lot of capacity and in, in the insurance world capacity means there's a lot of limits and a lot of carriers that are willing to write new business. So when mm. Uber and Lyft first came out, Interesting. you had a lot of, you had a lot of markets that were, that were willing to compete over the business, you know, auto liability, auto, auto physical damage wasn't thought of as the painful line of insurance it is today, and we can get mm -hmm. into that later. But really, at the, when Uber and Lyft first came out, you know, there wasn't much competition and there wasn't much understanding from the insurance side, again, kind of a glacial pace they move at, as to mm -hmm. the intricacies of the actual business. So what you had was actually a lot of firms who jumped in the fold at the very beginning who actually took some pretty painful losses on a lot of these, you know, not just Uber and Lyft type businesses, but, you know, your kind of more forward looking, you know, rentals, you know, your mm. zip cars, your, your, your first kind of, you know, renditions of a, you know, a newer focused or car or maybe sharing. More, yeah. Yeah. Car sharing, you know, rental operations that aren't, you know, your Hertz or your budget rental car. It's more of a, you know, personally delivered or location based rental 
um, which actually kind of set the tone for a lot of what a lot of carriers are doing today. Um, I, I won't say that, you know, those those insurance policies or those operators specifically are the core of why mm-hmm. the insurance market is, is currently in a hard state. But it certainly um, it certainly contributed to where insurance is today. Um, and it also taught a lot of these carriers some very valuable lessons about how to write these policies um, and what to expect out of loss history. Got it. And so I guess thinking about Uber and Lyft specifically, when you say insurers were looking to work with them, I guess there's really there were and are kind of two components. There's sort of the driver level, right? The actual companies that were offering what I guess you call rideshare insurance products. But then there's also the commercial insurance that, you know, actual TNCs like Uber and Lyft and, you know, even the zip cars and basically any shared fleet operator needs to maintain either to be licensed or just to make sure that they don't get sued or just because it's the right thing to do. Um, is that sort of where you delineate things or did, was there much of a difference there? Or how do you think about those sort of two differences? Well, I guess more from the insurance side. I mean, I'm, I guess I'm wondering more from that insurance side early on. What were these companies excited about to insure? Like, where did they see the opportunity to make money, basically? Um, you know, anytime you've got a big fleet uh, of vehicles, you know, what a lot of insurance companies get excited about is that they've got a really big pool of risk. Mm-hmm. And the standard model of insurance really tells you that the more, you know, the more people who get in the pool that, you know, the cheaper that that cost is going to be. Yeah. And so when you have a you have a few major carriers taking a look at these these models, which have, you know, in some cases, thousands of vehicles in specific cities. Mm-hmm. You know, do they are they concerned about the loss history? Of course. But you got to think about at the time you're dealing with a market of insurance that was very, very risk heavy. You know, they mm-hmm. were excited about writing risks because. If they look, you know, year over year, insurance companies review their losses. And if mm-hmm. we're talking 10, 15, you know, we're talking 10, 12 years ago, you know, you, you have a lot of insurance companies that haven't taken a lot of bad losses. So what, Got it. you know, it's not just about their, their, you know, appetite for writing risk. It's also that they're in a mode right now where they're, you know, they're eager to write, you know, good business, but they're also, you know, they're not being, you know, placed with as many restrictions as they would be today where losses are much more heavy. So in other words, taking a risk on something that's an unknown was a much more Mm. uh, widely accepted practice, you know, 10, 12 years ago uh, when we have a soft market that's, you know, that's really pushing carriers to take some risks. Yeah. And we'll definitely uh, talk about a little later, you know, sort of what the market looks like today. But I think it's interesting and sort of sounds like definitely a lot of these insurance uh, carriers were pretty interested on the fleet side, you know, working with the various shared fleet operators who, like you said, might have anywhere from 100 to, you know, thousands or even if, you know, the Uber and Lyfts, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of cars, you know, even in those early days, I guess where I'm thinking too on the from the drivers and sort of worker side is there was this rideshare insurance product and kind of what we saw there was there was actually like very slow going for a lot of these companies to come out with rideshare insurance products and it was very much a patchwork and different companies were offering different uh, services and it sounds like you know those kind of uh, the, one of the reasons for that was probably was a lot less lucrative for the companies most definitely and it, it was a result of you know the the few firms and the few insurance carriers that did start writing these policies it, it was a direct result of their of their actual loss history mm-hmm. you know as they got into these businesses and started writing them over you know the span of a couple to you know four or five six years yeah. um you know you, you, you take a carrier like james river who very notoriously last year non-renewed you know we're mm-hmm. talking uber and lyft you know they kind of cut them off midway through the policy term and while that was a huge you know, revenue consideration for that insurance market, you know, the losses to them just didn't outweigh the risk. uh, Sorry, Mm. the, the, you know, the premium they were collecting just didn't outweigh the risk that eventually, you know, started to come to the, into the fold, um, which has, you know, very much so contributed to the complexity of the market today where, you know, a lot of times you've got carriers that that model their risk off of actual figures. Of course, that's what you want to do. You want your actuarial team to punch the numbers and understand, you know, where are these losses going to be? What can we expect out of writing this account? You know, because at the end of the day, every insurance carrier wants to make money on the risks they're insuring. Mm -hmm. However, you know, another tactic in my time in insurance that I've seen is, you know, a lot of times carriers will, will, will kind of mimic what, what the big brand names do. So what, when you're talking about today, when you have a carrier with the notoriety of James River and they really made their, their name, you know, working with a lot of TNCs like Uber and Lyft, when they've kind of, you know, kind of dialed it back a little bit on as to how they're going to really apply their underwriting playbook to mm-hmm. these companies, 
what you have is a general market you know sway what 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 other carriers that are interested in this space you know this culturally changes the direction of their their entire organization you know they see you know in other words the big brand name decided to stop doing this so we we probably you know we haven't written as much of this we should probably do the same thing that and that's not a guarantee but in my time in insurance i can tell you um a lot of carriers will see what the you know the bigger companies in their space do and they will very closely mimic um the attitudes or even like the underwriting guidelines that that were implemented in that scenario and you know they'll take them as their own but in, in yeah. actuality they're really just seeing you know a carrier's direct response to loss activity and just using it for themselves got it so i want to quickly maybe define a few terms because uh, you know even though i am a, 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 i wouldn't say ex, insurance expert i'm sort of more like an insurance uh, amateur i i do sometimes get these mixed up and i think it could be helpful for the audience i mean even maybe taking one step back like it sounds like you work with like let's call them a lot of shared fleet operators and i would you know kind of think when i when i say that term i think of people like uber and lyft you know it's sort of they're sharing a fleet and maybe the drivers are providing the cars but it's still this shared fleet you know a zip car is more of a car sharing um is that, is that what you think of like are those the types of companies you work with shared fleet operators yeah so in, in our practice group we you know we work with a, mostly we, we just like to configure it to on-demand service firms so whether mm. you're sharing vehicles you're sharing scooters you're sharing e-bikes mm. or even you're sharing services such as you know dog walking or massage services mm. or you know in-home care babysitting you know a lot Got of it. times um, it's a very broad category, category, but at the end of the day, it's really a, you know, are you using your phone to, to share a vehicle, to share a bike, to share, a, uh, you mm-hmm. know, to, to get your, your groceries delivered, um, to get your food delivered. It's really any kind of on-demand service that, that takes advantage of a shared service, um, such as, you know, sharing vehicles, share, you know, yeah. so on and so forth. And so what are you, what is your role or sort of title? Are you a broker? Yeah, so I'm an insurance broker. I, I, um, I, I estab- as you know, as you very kindly mentioned, I established our uh, micro mobility and shared economy uh, practice group here at USI across the U.S. Um, in 2018, kind of at the um, core of the beginning of the kind of the insure tech and micro mobility mm-hmm. movement. Um, and what I've done is, as our leader is I've been able to secure a lot of privileged relationships with very unique um, and customized insurance carriers that focus specifically on this space. Uh, and the beauty of working with a lot of these companies is I haven't only managed my own book within this, the scope of this, I've also been able to you know, take a lot of more experienced insurance brokers at USI. You know, again, I'm only 33 years old, but in this mm-hmm. situation, you know, given the reins by my company, I've been able to you know, re- revive a lot of lost opportunities we've had as a firm due to the complexity of these placements. And, and bring it. into the fold a lot of these new markets and a lot of these new terms, and frankly, a lot of our USI specific now relationships that really have driven down the cost for a lot of our prospects and clients, um, and, and and been able to provide a, a considerable amount of value add to not just their you know total cost of risk, but also you know how does the insurance apply to them operationally? You know how can we how can yeah. we break the mold a little bit to make sure that we're we're, we're also providing a solution that scales and that you yeah. know, is easily accessible by drivers and employees and you know it fits the mold as opposed to some of the traditional carriers that you know sometimes will write an insurance policy that while you know maybe inexpensive or, or maybe you know cost competitive you know their their culture almost of of operations isn't quite a perfect fit with you know the operator that they're insuring yeah. So you mentioned carrier. So you guys are a broker, USI, as I guess a brokerage firm. Um, that sounds right. And then uh, the carriers, like you mentioned, James River is a carrier. What's the difference there? What's a carrier, insurance carrier? Uh, so, so an insurance carrier is really a, is, a, is a market for a risk. So as an insurance broker, I go to a operator. So let's say I'm speaking with a DoorDash or a mm-hmm. Uber or, you know, any of the TNCs, DNCs, you know, in the community here. Um, I go to them and I, I, I take their risk. I, I get an understanding of their drivers, of their vehicle counts, of, of, you know, multiple different factors in order to market their risk. And I take it out to market to see what different carriers, in other words, in, insurance markets, insurance carriers, synonymous terms, you know, who's going to bring us the best terms and, and the best price. The best way to look hmm. at it is, you know, as a, as a, 
as a as a person you know you you want your automobile coverage right you buy a new car you need to get it insured and insurance carriers your state farms your progressives mm-hmm. your geico's you know when we're talking that's the personal level but when we're talking on the corporate level you know a lot of those branches gotcha. state, state farm will write some you know corporate business but um that's that's mm-hmm. you know just an analogy for you know corporately how our our model works so i'm assuming then a lot of the corporate carriers are more brands that we have never heard of. I mean, I'm familiar with James Rivers because of the Uber and Lyft connection, but I assume 99% of people outside of Rideshare probably have never heard of them. What are the, what are just some of the other big names in the sort of, I guess, uh, carriers uh, group that you, you know, I guess mar- are marketing this risk to just so we know? Yeah, of course. So um, to give you an example, you know, for like Tesla has a new program right now where you can kind of buy your own auto insurance when you get your car and that's through Markel. Um, you've got, mm-hmm. you know, a, a variety of Lloyd's of London markets, um, one in particular um, that, that, that is very, you know, that insured Lyft um, and Airbnb from the kind of very get go. So they're, you know, mm-hmm. Apollo, Lloyd's of London is considered one of the, um, the, the stronger brands in the space is it, because they've got been it. there since the very beginning. You know, you have some new entrants um, here and there that can provide some competitive terms against J- James River is there, but. Again, they're you know they're in a in a period right now where they're reviewing their book and they're they're while they're a great mm. player they're kind of still determining where the best um, you know growth areas are for them within mobility. Uh, you have Hartford's uh, subsidiary called Wirisk um, that's done a lot of Got great it. work in the space and uh, candidly has been very well supported by a very traditional insurance carrier Hartford. Um, counter I mean, it's against what I actually was expecting you know. In my experience, a lot of times when you get the bigger brand names in and you really hit the nail on the head there with kind of, if you don't know the brand name, it's kind of a, a you know, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily um, equate to not being a great value here because, you know, um, Hartford getting into the fold with virus, to me, I looked at that as maybe something that would bring in a few more strings or, you know, a, a couple more complexities to getting the business written. Uh, but at the end of the day, they've actually done a very great job of supporting virus in their ability to grow and build a true, you know, mobility product. Got it. Okay, cool. Well, I I think those are sort of the main definitions that I wanted to go over. Very helpful. Is there any other definitions you think people should know about um, as far as insurance terms? Or is that pretty much the main ones? Um, Those are those are your standard, you know, broker carrier relationships, you know, a lot of times there'll be, you know, a wholesaler market involved. Um, which I know can confuse some and even friends of mine who aren't quite sure how the insurance process works um, to, to, to most people aren't, who aren't familiar. A wholesale market is generally used by um, smaller insurance brokers who need access to a wider array of uh, insurance carriers. So wholesale, groups, you can think of them as kind of a, you know, I need access to the, the, the insurance markets that write more difficult risks. And yeah. you know, I don't have direct access to them. I need to speak with a wholesale insurance broker who can then connect me to wholesale insurance markets, which could otherwise be defined as ENS markets or surplus lines markets. If, if you know, any of your listeners have heard those terms before. Cool. So this is going to be the fun part. So I'm going to basically, let's pretend I'm a brand new rideshare company and I'm getting ready to launch. I'm getting ready to get started. Uh, what type of insurance do I need? I mean, I have a lot of people that come to me, uh, you know, with various ideas about new rideshare companies, some more legit, some more thought out than others, some more funding than others. And, uh, you know, you're actually one of the people that I refer a lot of those folks to, but I've never actually uh, sat on the other side. So I guess if you could uh, pretend that I'm uh, someone you know, in that position, starting a new rideshare company, what, what, what type of insurance do I need and what should I think about? Of course. So again, I, this kind of goes back to, you know, when I, I, I told you about like Uber and Lyft first launching, the regulatory involvement wasn't as heavily uh, mandating exactly what they need to be covering as an organization. However, now, you know, each state and each city within, within the states has, has developed a pretty robust set of requirements for um, yeah. what, what to insure for your business. So let's say you have an auto sharing operation here in California. Um, typically mm-hmm. what we'll need to, do, to review is, you know, any specific requirements of your state or your, you know, the Department of Transportation. You know, you see a lot of rideshare operators yeah. partnering with, you know, say LA DOT or, you know, San Francisco DOT or Oakland DOT. A lot of times these, these, these entities will have their own contractual or permit requirements for, you know, the operators within their programs or, right. or just operating within their city. But then you also need to take a look at the larger scale and see what the state would require. 
Uh, a lot of time, the state states, I'd say a good rule of thumb is that most states will require three times the legal limit of liability for personal autos. So in other words, mm-hmm. you know, in California, I think the, the personal limit is 15, uh, 15, 10, 5. Um, or it's, you know, 15,000, 10,000 and, and 5,000 for medical payments, or it may be 10,000. You know, what you have there is a lot of times the state will require three times that amount to operate as a shared vehicle operator. Um, yeah. so, you know, what you want to do as you're really for first starting as an organization is, uh, is, is make sure that you're compliant with your regulatory authorities. Make sure you've got the correct yeah. protections in place. That's sort of that state and city, you know, level, um, basically regulatory wise. Right. And, and if you're just started getting started out the door, a lot of times that'll be a great place to start, you know, but what I, I find is mm-hmm. that a lot of these firms I work with that are growing, you know, up to, you know, 300, 400, 500 vehicles or units, um, you know, a lot of times it, it starts to become a question of, is that really enough insurance? So really what you want to start to do there is to really benchmark the size of your firm, you know, maybe even procure an additional excess limit of liability to make sure that you're your, your, your company is protected. You know, it's one thing to protect your drivers and your vehicles. It's a whole nother consideration to protect your company should, you know, should the driver and, and the operator in question. So, you know, you know, whatever your business is, if that's listed on a demand letter from a lawyer, you know, a lot of times those can be thrown out, but as uh, you know, as I'm sure a lot of your listeners are aware, defense costs can sometimes be incurred regardless of fault. And, in that type of a situation, you want to make sure that your entity is actually being provided coverage as well, so you can provide a defense yeah. and, and get back to work. Yeah, and that sort of makes sense. So basically, what you're saying is you sort of need that kind of, you know, look at the basic requirements of either the state, you know, CPUC, for example, in California, California Public Utilities Commission that regulates TNCs. And I know they've got a set of requirements when it comes to insurance in order to get your permit, you need to follow through with that. And then there may be additional ones at the state level, but also at the same time, that may just be a minimum. And it may only, you know, may not actually cover everything you need, but you sort of, you know, I think kind of put it in, and this is sort of why, uh, you know, one of the reasons why I like speaking with you, because you also think about the business side of things, right? If you're a brand new operator and, you know, you're kind of looking at all your costs, like the excess liability, if you, you know, sometimes there's a certain point, right, where the tipping point now you can kind of, it makes more sense to, you know, kind of go and get every single insurance that you might need. But when you're early and you're just starting, maybe you just want more of the bare minimum, because if you have to pay that excess, you could go out of business, right? (laughs) If you're a startup. And, 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 you know, and and candidly that, you know, when we're talking right now, I mentioned earlier, we're in a hard market. I, I, I'd say, you know, there are a lot of competitive programs out there, but competitiveness is relative. And, you know, the price a mm-hmm. lot of times for startup operators, whether you're starting with scooters, bikes, vehicles, you know, shared services, a lot of times I find that even startups in the space are, are unaware of really where the costs for these are, are really going to start. And a lot of times that can, yeah. that can inundate the budget a little bit. And of course, I'd never preach to anyone to overinsure, but, you know, we want to be smart and You know, a lot of times what my team will do is provide a a robust spectrum of kind of, you know, over-insuring, you know, adequate insurance maybe, and then maybe kind of your cost-saving kind of um, mindset-based placement, which, of course, is never truthfully my recommendation. But, again, budget is always king here, and we got to make sure that we're protecting companies while also, you know, considering the budget constraints they're up against. Yeah. So let's talk about budget because I know this is one thing that uh, is always surprising to a lot of people that are starting shared fleets is just how expensive the insurance costs are, um, you know, for their various fleets. Are there specific examples? I don't know if you can share, you know, actual companies and what they're paying. I'm assuming not, but maybe you can kind of share more hypotheticals or just, you know, sort of we can get in the ballpark. You know, maybe if you have a shared fleet that you recently quoted or, you know, even in comparing that to scooters or bikes, just so we kind of know what uh, ballpark uh, figures we're talking in or examples. Yeah, of course. So I, I you know, the I, I, I say sticking more strictly to um, vehicles. And I, I do want to preface this by saying every operation is different. Um, I think it, it's, sure. it's worthwhile for anyone listening to know that um, the insurance market actually has a very interesting position within the shared mobility world. They've seen almost, you know, especially a lot of the carriers I work with who have now kind of established themselves as the go-tos or at least the best brand names within the space, you know, one big thing they have seen is, is they've seen all of your peers. So if you're a startup and you're, and you're, you're jumping in the fold here and you'd like to get insurance, you need to know that not only have the better companies gone through some of these markets, but also some of the companies that have gone out of business have gone through these markets. So mm-hmm. these insurance carriers actually have a very great understanding 
for the different aspects of your business that actually do calculate out to material you know, insurance considerations. And one of the things I thought I would, I would preface this but with saying is everyone is different, and, and I truthfully don't you know, the uniqueness of this industry d- means that a lot of times you're going to see a very wide variety of premiums. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, you know, a big consideration for a lot of these carriers is financial solvency. And I, I would recommend to any of your listeners or anyone, you know, um, getting ready to launch a business to make sure that as soon as you begin your search for the insurance, as soon as you start going down that path, you know, whether you've got great funding or whether your balance sheet's in great, you know, great place or not, I would really encourage everyone there to be very forward, you know, sign your NDAs where you need to. Obviously, don't be giving information in a way it will, but to really focus in on providing a very good and robust balance sheet and forward-looking statements to your carriers because they're going to they're going to evaluate your solvency, they're going to evaluate your your company and how well they think you're going to do based off of who they've worked with. And a lot of times that can be something you want to really, you know, you want to take that time, you almost want to approach them as if they're, you know, a new investor. Getting that little rant out of the way, I will say that right now, you know, the last couple of placements I've done for for some owned vehicles, um, we're talking and we're talking about probably between fifteen and eighteen hundred dollars per vehicle per year. Um, that's a, that's a very general mm-hmm. place to start, but that's about where we where where my team has been able to bring some some pricing in these days. Um, and I would tell anyone who's got that pricing that that's about the best the market can offer at this point in time. If you yeah. throw in, you know, and that's just for pure third-party liability. So if you throw in physical mm-hmm. damage, and, and to define that more clearly, it's kind of your bumps and bruises. It's your, your fender bender type claims. Um, I would say to add, you know, add, add at least a couple hundred dollars to that, if not more. Um, physical damage is its own yeah. little beast nowadays, and I would recommend any operator launching to really evaluate why you, you might be considering physical damage coverage and, and what the benefits might be. Because in the market today, it is something that I can tell you is a very mixed um, mixed uh, subject. A lot of people might say it's good, and a lot of people mm-hmm. might say it's bad. It really depends on you as the firm as to whether or not you think you can control these accidents. And if you really think that the, the cash flow benefit of moving to a physical damage program might be in your best interest. But again, that kind of goes back to every program is different. Every operator is different. You really have to you know, you can't, this isn't a boilerplate industry. I can't take any of my clients yeah. and just prepackage it and expect an insurance carrier to give me what I want. I have to drill into every single specific piece of their operation to make sure that we are providing a cost-effective platform that, that perfectly addresses exactly what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah. No, I actually really like that answer because I think a lot of us are always hoping that there's some simple, oh, you know, it's going to be like you said, right? $2,000 a car or a hundred thousand dollar minimum or whatever it might be. But I think that you actually brought up a number of points, you know, from the financial solvency to, you know, even the way that the, you know, the business of the shared fleet, right? If you're starting a rideshare company, for example, uh, you know, with Uber and Lyft, and let's say you're trying to be a fleet owner and put cars onto the Uber and Lyft platform, that's very different risk profile than being the actual TNC, you know, that is, you know, kind of bringing drivers on. And so I think a lot of that probably does matter. And I don't don't think we're going to get into all those details today, because the more I think about it, I think you're right. It's very situation dependent. And it sounds like on a number of different factors, too. Absolutely. And I guess the main message being, you know, if, if the insurance partner you work with is asking you a lot of questions, I would oblige them because, the more detailed yeah. you can be, the better job they can do with their carrier partners to get you the program that you need. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, even as just a separate data point, for example, you know, we work with a lot of drivers in New York City and in New York City to be an Uber and Lyft driver, you do need commercial insurance and uh, TLC licensing. So it's much higher barrier to entry. But typically a lot of the policies, you know, that these drivers are getting, they say that they're around three to five thousand dollars per year. So that's sort of, you know, like a full individual commercial level uh, policy that these drivers are getting. And, you know, they're not getting much in the way from Uber and Lyft just because of the way the setup 
is there. So just another interesting data point. So you can kind of imagine, you know, if you're, that's a ballpark. And <laughs> as you start to add hundreds, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of cars, it gets pretty expensive. You know, just one more question on the pricing. Uh, you know, one other thing I've heard that there are a lot of minimums, right? Because I'm assuming, or maybe not I'm assuming, but I, I've heard that a lot of these uh, carriers basically will make you, you know, buy 100000 or $200,000 worth of insurance before they'll even talk to you. Is, is that true? That is true. So, and, and that, that that's true for a lot of reasons, actually going back to kind of our financial solvency standards there. So, you know, the way, again, it, it, knowledge is kind of both the, the, the enemy and, and the friend here, because what you have with a lot of these insurance carriers is they, they know what to expect at a loss history. You'd be surprised how often, you know, I brought mm. a new piece of business to a, a different carrier and, you know, the loss history might not be great, but they're actually pretty, you know, amenable to the risk because they've seen this before. So that's kind of how that's a good thing that they mm -hmm. know your business while at the same time, you know, they, they know not only the fact that you could potentially go out of business, they also know how bad claims could potentially be. So what a lot of carriers will do, um, and, and you won't see this on, if you, if you have a relationship with the carrier, you typically won't see this because they've, They've written your risk already, and they know you, and they know that your business is working, and they 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 actually have direct feedback as to your your specific claims history. However, if if you're in a mode right now, mm -hmm. which a lot of people are with with coronavirus and specific ratings and whatnot, and we can get into that, but a lot of people are in the mindset now to maybe market their insurance a little bit more aggressively. And a lot of times, while you have carriers in the space that know the space well. A lot of times these carriers, um, a lot of times when you switch, your, you switch between them, they're going to, you know, th they want their kind of chunk of change or, or their chunk of pound of flesh up front. And the reason they want that is not mm -hmm. just because they are very concerned with the loss history and they haven't written your business. So while they might have some numbers from different clients that they could get a decent actuarial table, you know, developed to, to make a good prediction about where you your specific firm will be with losses, they still don't know. We're still in a phase where actually a lot of carriers in the space are making very educated guesses, as opposed to some of the you know more traditional lines of insurance where sometimes they even have 50, 60 years of loss data to really you know to yeah. drill into those numbers, and they know exactly what to expect. You need to remember that in this space. Even some of the more experienced carriers don't have every loss that's ever occurred. You know, they're they're asking for that minimum up front because a the risk is inherently you know dangerous. It, it is inherently something that that is going to have lots of claims. But they're also you know they're they're also doing it to make sure if you get two three months into the policy period that you don't just cancel the policy and leave the carrier on the hook for yeah. those months of what they consider to be extremely risky exposure. So it, it is a preventative measure it. Brought, in, it brought in by the carriers to make sure that they, um, their guesses and their, their rating model is going to be accurate. Um, but I will say, too, as soon as, as soon as any operator has surpassed those minimums, you, you're, you're getting into very competitive territory. I mean, it's, it's really kind of a cost of entry is the best way I would, I would uh, encourage uh, all folks to consider that, that minimum that you're up against. Got it. Yeah, that's interesting. And I mean, I think you also mentioned, you know, if I'm, uh, I'm also thinking about it, kind of made me think about, right, if this is something that's expensive, it's a big part of my business. If I'm a new, you know, rideshare company or fleet operator, you know, one thing you highlighted was sort of just, you know, showcasing really the financial solvency or basically showing these carriers how strong your business is. And it sounds like that could potentially reduce premiums. Are there any other sort of suggestions or yeah, I would even say like insurance hacks or anything like that? Like, you know, one small example, Example that I don't know if you're familiar with, but when we were working with a lot of these uh, early sort of rideshare companies, competitors to Uber and Lyft, I know one thing that they did was actually get liability only policies, and then they would encourage their drivers to go with a personal carrier like State Farm that provided full uh, coverage during periods zero, one, two, and three. Whereas you know a lot of the carriers you know rely on Uber and Lyft during period two and three. So that was like a neat workaround that I know some of these smaller companies were doing and you know kind of reduce their premiums while at the same time not kind of screwing over their drivers or is there anything else like that that you've seen or kind of uh, you know more even more general recommendations for companies to think about when going out and getting insurance or soliciting it but you know going directly to your question i think 
you know, making sure you know what city you're in, what the legal, you know, precedents are with regards to mm. working with TNCs and DNCs. You know, if you really truly only need to be covering period zero or period one and encouraging your drivers to purchase, you know, and maintain their own policies. You know, at the end of the day, the last thing you want to do as an operator in any capacity is leave someone out to dry with insurance companies. And so in, in, right. encouraging your, your user base. And, and this even goes to, you know, some of my, you know, some of my, you know, scooter and e-bike partners out there. You know, if you, you know, what you have there is a much more premature industry than the vehicle sharing insurance. And a lot of times, you mm -hmm. know, if you're a rider on those, a lot of times, and, and I mentioned this, frankly, to even friends of mine who ride scooters or e-bikes, you know, as part of their commute or, you know, maybe more nowadays because, you know, there's not much to do. So they're trying to get outside a little bit um, is to buy your own, you know, umbrella policy as, as, a, as just a, as a consumer to protect yourself from any accidents mm. you might have on these scooters or bikes. You know, it, it, this is a new mobility mm, wave. And it, it does require sitting down for a second and really considering, you know, where could there be potential liabilities with our business? Let's make sure we aren't leaving our users, our customers, or our drivers out to dry at any given stage, at any period of coverage. You know, it really does take that granular approach to, to really play out, you know, where could losses occur and what could this, you know, due to our user or driver base. Yeah, no, that's actually a good point. I never really thought about that. I mean, I guess, you know, thinking about it from the consumer perspective with ride share, you know, you're the one, especially if you're a passenger in an Uber or Lyft, you're sitting there in the back seat. I think it's pretty minimal risk to you in that sense. You know, I think even if you get into an accident, you're the one usually suing Uber and Lyft or the carriers. But I guess what you're saying is, you know, if you're riding a scooter and you run into someone or you cause damage or anything like that, then there's potential personal liability since, you know, no one's actually, you know, especially on the consumer side, I doubt anyone is aware of what the, uh, you know, sort of shared operator of the day that they're riding on. And there's so many of them. So that's actually really interesting. So sounds like uh, you can kind of help companies assess all that. Um, you know, I do want to think about or ask you about uh, the types of companies that you're working with. And then maybe we'll end with, you know, just sort of what the market looks like today and how COVID has impacted that. But first, you know, you mentioned TNCs, you mentioned these shared fleet operators, bikes, scooters uh it sounds like you kind of handle yeah. it all so um it, it, it all kind of fits within the realm of the gig economy or you know our micro mobility and shared economy practice um but you know it, it, it's all mm -hmm. a very similar um you know with e-bikes and, and scooters being a little bit more of a, of a of a niche within a niche um you know it's all you know all the markets yeah. involved with these are pretty similar players a lot of the you know relationships we have with our markets um, you know, I, that there's no guarantee that one market that writes an e-bike risk will write a scooter risk. And I would also encourage anyone listening that mm -hmm. that is never something you should expect. Everything is going to be looked at differently. Um, sometimes one insurance market might even consider one e-bike risk and one and, and decline a different one. Um, again, today, it's just mm -hmm. really about um, while we do, you know, within the nubility um, arena, our, our practice group is rather broad and all encompassing. It doesn't mean that we aren't getting incredibly granular and specific around not just what insurers we're approaching for the specific company we are talking to, but, you know, also to make sure that we are di differentiating Got it. Cool. And I think I want to kind of end a conversation with sort of, we, we've talked a little bit about what the market looks like today, but I mean, obviously COVID has had a big impact on everyone's lives and, uh, you know, specific industries. How has it affected insurance and specifically the operators that you're talking to or working with? Absolutely. It's a great question. So um, in my early days of getting this practice group started, you know, one of the main reasons um, I got I got involved was because of the um, I, I, um, the di the disservice I felt was generally being applied from the insurance brokerage community towards a lot of these operators, and the main reason I, the the main focus point of that for me is you know I've seen I I would argue to 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 the end of the day that you know that that ride sharing that new mobility is completely different than transportation. And what I saw when I first started writing and getting a lot of clients in the space is that a lot of my competition was placing, you know, these these, you know, owned vehicle fleets or these or, or these sometimes completely non-owned vehicle fleets. You know, you, you, you got people who are putting their cars on a platform and letting other people use them. You know, a lot of times mm -hmm. these risks were being placed with insurance carriers 
um, very antiquated insurance carriers that have a very antiquated way they approach the risk. And while those risks might be well served within a transportation model, so, you know, point A to point B delivery type models, you know, yeah. think about trucking here. While that might be applicable there, you know, I, this comes back to coronavirus because one of the, the first things I noticed when we were starting this practice group was that, you know, a lot of times my competition is using a rating model that to me just feels out of place. And the reason it does is because mm-hmm. what I would come up against is a, is a per vehicle unit charge. You know, it costs X amount per vehicle per month or X amount per vehicle per year. In fact, that's actually why I gave you my benchmarking for pricing for per vehicle per year, Mm -hmm. because very even to this day, most of my clients will will come to me saying, all right, well, I'm at X amount per car per year. Can you beat that? And that's actually the only Mm -hmm. reason and the very only reason I brought that up as my benchmarking, because that seems to me the language that most operators in the space are used to dealing with. However, Thanks to coronavirus, a lot of my messaging behind this, because to me, I think that a pure per, per vehicle charge, um, while you ha- well, when you have smaller fleets, might not play out to be as a big a differentiator as, as it would with larger fleets. You know, my recommendation always to my clients is to go with a pure usage model. And what that means is your insurance is rated purely off of the miles you put on the road. Or maybe, you know, maybe it's not miles. Maybe it's the minutes your you know your scooters or your e-bikes are being used per rental you know they're they're they're, Hmm. a lot of these markets are willing to get very smart about their rates and i think that coronavirus you know again this message has 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 hit home with a lot of my clients and and we we put those policies in place some of my clients wanted to stick to their guns and stay with um and stay with the per vehicle modeling which sometimes is the right way to go it just depends on what your operation is but because of coronavirus the biggest thing i have seen as of late is you know both clients and prospects telling me hey ed you know the you know my premium is the same amount as it was last month and my usership went from 90 percent to 30 percent because of coronavirus yeah why am i paying the same insurance premium and i I can't help but completely agree with that statement you aren't putting cars in the road you are i mean you might have a risk of keeping the cars in storage which is always a risk you know there could be a fire there could be vandalism there could be thefts however you know, the, the risk is drastically changed when you don't yeah. have the vehicles on the road. And for, for anyone to be paying the same premium, the, you know, a, a month where their usership has taken considerable hits is just unacceptable to me. And something I, I completely um, think is, is, is that the coronavirus is bringing a lot of that to the table. It's bringing a lot of the attention around that. Um, into people's budgets and they're seeing directly why this kind of usership based model might be a better choice for their operations. And I think that because of this, you're going to see a huge shift um, in the next you know, hmm. six to 12 months from, you know, a lot of the more traditional insurance carriers. Um, and I don't want to call them out, uh, but you know, they know who they <laughs> are, um, you know, offering these per vehicle charges to strictly, you know, um, you know, losing that initiative and just going straight towards a usage usage based model because, you know, again, who knows how long coronavirus is going to last? I, I I think that especially if anyone listening has had this issue happen to them, they know how valuable it could be um, to their yeah. their cash flow to not be overpaying for insurance in months where their their revenues also drip dropped. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and I think it much better aligns the incentives, you know, with the, you know, kind of expenses that you're paying with the success of the company. If you have high utilization on all of your vehicles, you're probably not going to be that upset to pay more in insurance versus like what you said, right? If your revenues are way down and you still have these fixed insurance costs, that can be really challenging. And it kind of reminds me even, you know, what of one of the reasons why Uber and Lyft were able to weather the coronavirus so well is because they can variableize their expenses all the way down, right? They've got all these drivers on on their platform, but they don't own any of the inventory. So when revenues go way down, they sort of pass some of the costs or all of the costs on to drivers and they can kind of effectively save a lot of money there. So very interesting and uh, definitely sounds like you're able to provide a lot of help. And, uh, you know, even reminds me too, you know, a lot of the personal carriers are now coming out with these big marketing campaigns, which are obviously some part PR and marketing, but saying that, hey, you know, we're going to reduce your premiums because you're not driving and, you know, they're giving 10 to 15% discounts or, you know, refunds or whatever it might be. I'm assuming that they're seeing way less than 10 to 15% driving, but it's still a nice gesture. So sounds like maybe even uh, you're kind of taking a little 
little bit of what the personal carriers are doing on that side and doing a great job marketing and applying that to some of the companies you work with. Yeah, and, and I, I would just, with, with the caution, of course, that, you know, the, the, I'd say the main difference there between the personal, you know, lines insurance world and the commercial lines world is, you know, those commercial lines carriers aren't going to give you that, that, that kickback. They, you know, with coronavirus, uh, right. The church, you got to get it. <laughs> you, you've got to, you've got to show them why you really, it's not something they're just going to yeah. offer up to you. It is something where, you know, a midterm in the middle of your policy, it might be difficult to negotiate, but if anyone's on a fixed yeah. cost model right now, I'd say your number one priority for your renewal would be to talk to your carrier about a variable cost model to make sure you're using the best metrics possible to evaluate your risk. Nice. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. And if you want to share a little bit more information about the work you're doing, if people want to contact you or, you know, even talk about, you know, the types of companies that should uh, reach out to you or how you work with folks. I mean, I know you're obviously very well entrenched in the shared fleet operator, but uh, feel free to elaborate there. Yeah, of course. I mean, if you're, if you're launching a, a shared vehicle service, a, you know, a vehicle, an owned vehicle service that's promoting, you know, uh, easy costs for new and Uber and Uber and Lyft drivers. You know, if you're providing vehicles for those folks, um, I've got some great very yeah. industry competitive rates right now and very operationally um, conducive carriers that can really promote and maybe even sometimes reduce the cost or at least the time, the turnaround time of doing, you know, of the insurance aspect of your operation. You know, if you're, if you're starting a new, you know, um, you know, a deli food delivery service or a new, you know, I, I've had a few folks talk to me lately about a very specific niche of, of you know, deliveries or sorry, um, of, of shuttling services. So if you're, you know, if you're a mm. smaller operator with like 10, 15 cars moving people to and from a specific point, or maybe it's a last mile delivery, or, you know, maybe you're just offering up services on a mobile application where you have your drivers, whether they're W2s or 1099s, delivering that service. I can, I can certainly help anyone who'd like to reach out with, even, you know, maybe some, some good MBR resources, some great technological resources. And then, of course, at the very end of the day, some great suggestions for where to take the insurance um, and some considerations for you to make as you move forward. Or, you know, if we're even talking about some folks just throwing around the idea of launching one of these enterprises, you know, I'm always happy to field a call about what to expect on cool. costs, you know, of doing business and, and what different states actually cool. might be easier to do business within. Hmm. Yeah. How can people uh, find you or reach out to you? Uh, easiest number to get me at is uh, is my cell phone, which is 847-436-4072. Um, and I am happy to field calls anytime, as well as my email address is edward.walker at usi.com. And of course, you can always find me on LinkedIn, super easy. Um, it might be Edward Bruce Walker on LinkedIn, but pretty easy to find um, and always happy to take a question. Cool. And we'll leave all that info in the show notes. Uh, you know, this podcast was very inspiring. So you might get a deluge of phone calls now to your cell phone, but hopefully you don't mind, Ed. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on and chatting insurance and also educating me and updating me on everything that's going on in the industry. Of course, Harry. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Take care.